the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire and, and, and the Muslim empires in Europe and the Middle East are forming and, and developing. We also have empires developing in East Asia as well. And so we're going to go through some of these different empires that developed. In China, you have the Tang and Song dynasties that develop. First is the Tang, which rules from about 618 to 907 AD. Uh, the Tang are founded by a man named Tang Taozong, um, another notable ruler during this, this dynasty uh, is Wu Zhou, uh, who was actually a woman, so she was the only woman to ever hold the official title of empress in Chinese history. Uh, she kind of had control indirectly through her husband beforehand um, and sons afterwards, but then she takes the title for herself later on. Um, in Tang China, Confucianism, which we talked about earlier in Chinese history, is kind of revived and brought back to strengthen the bureaucracy or the government in China to make it more effective and efficient. Um, but Tang, the Tang eventually decline. Uh, they lose and de are defeated by Muslims in central Asia, in central China, um, and they lose that territory. And by 907, the Tang are overthrown. And what takes their place is the Song Dynasty. And the Song Dynasty rules from 960 to 1279 AD, uh, founded by a man named Tai Tzu. Um, uh, and they are not as large or as powerful as the Tang or the Han before them. Um, the people from the northern region known as Manchuria invade them uh, and take over the northern part of their empire. And so they only rule in southern China uh, for the second half of their, of their reign. But what's really impressive during this time period is that China's population explodes. If you know it all today, China is the largest country in the world by population. They have over a billion people. Back in the year 1000, right, they had 100 million people. Uh, there are plenty of countries in today's own, in today's world that don't have this many people. Uh, and during the Song era, Song era, China had 10 cities with over a million people. Again, that's a, a, something that not, not a lot of countries today can even claim. So this is a massive empire, a massive population. And during both the Tang and Song, what happens is the development of what's called Neo-Confucianism, or the New Confucianism. Right? And they synthesize and they bring together Confucian thought with Buddhist spirituality. Right, So we know Buddhism started in India um, and Confucianism starts in China. But as Buddhism spreads and it really takes hold in China, it starts m melding together with, with Confucianism. Uh, this chart should look familiar from the assignment that you guys have been working on. But the Tang and Song are, have a lot of these achievements or advancements or innovations that they make. Um, some of the most notable are printing uh, and use of gunpowder, right? So things that Europe doesn't have until the 1100s, 1200s, they don't get the printing press until the 1400s, right? Um, the Chinese have been using for centuries already, right? So the Chinese, these advancements are way ahead of what's going on in Europe during the Middle Ages. And eventually Europe adapts these things and will eventually use them to their own benefit and become the major powers in the world. But at this time, it's really China. Another group of people to the north of China are the Mongols. Um, they develop on the steppe, which is this large, vast area of land that's dry and flat, um, similar to the Great Plains in the United States. The middle of our country is kind of similar to the area the Mongols are living in, and it's called the steppe. They're pastoralists, meaning they herd domestic, domestic animals, so, you know, cattle, goats, horses, things like that. Uh, they live a semi-nomadic life, right? So they move around a lot, but they go to the same places throughout the year. So different points of the year, they live in certain parts of, of the territory of their country. Many people in Mongolia today are still living this lifestyle. Around the year 1200 AD, so in the Middle Ages in, in Europe, right? About a century and a half before uh, the Black Death in Europe, you have a man named Temujin. Uh, who unifies all the different clans living in Mongolia, and he takes the title of Genghis Khan. So you might have heard that name, Genghis Khan, before. Uh, it's it's translates to universal ruler. So he gets that title in 1206, and for the next 20 years, he conquers most of Asia, China and Central Asia. He This empire is massive. And if you look at the map that you guys have in your handout, you'll see how just how large the Mongolian empire stretches once it you know, reaches its height with his children and grandchildren. He was a really talented general and strategist, right? He knew how to organize troops. He knew how to send them and how to attack and how to surprise people. 
he also used, was not afraid to use terror to force his enemies to surrender. He would go and kill a whole city of people, men, women, and children, uh, and use that terror to force people to surrender. Uh, his descendants continued the conquering that he started, um, eventually reached Persia, the Middle East, and Russia. They established what are called Khanates, uh, which are pretty much this giant empire is divided into four different regions. Each of his, one descendant of his rules each of them. And while they were pretty vicious during war, the Mongols were actually relatively tolerant in peace, as long as these people pay their tribute and pay their taxes. They don't force their beliefs on them, they don't attack them, and they even actually adapt to the new cultures that they come into. So the Mongols, for example, uh, some Mongols in, in Russia and the Middle East adapt to Islam, convert to Islam. Uh, and some in China convert and adapt the ways of the Chinese government and uh, Buddhism. And kind of building off of the idea of the Pax Romana that we talked about uh, during the Roman Empire, the height of the Roman Empire, uh, historians use the term Pax Mongolica to talk about a period of peace and prosperity that was a result of the Mongols controlling such a huge territory. They controlled so much and of the Silk Road's trade routes in Eurasia, which is the continent of Europe and Asia. Uh, and from the, year, from the centuries of the 1200s to 1300, um, there's relative peace that improves trading and, and wealth and prosperity along these Silk Roads. Uh, another famous leader of the Mongols is a man named Kublai Khan. He was the grandson of Genghis Khan, and he is the one who takes control of China and Mongolia, which is essentially like the homeland, the main part of the Mongolian Empire. Uh, he establishes a dynasty after the Tang fall, which is known as the Wan dynasty. Uh, he is an able ruler. He facilitates trades, and his empire stretches so far. He can bring in trade and goods from all these different parts of the world. Uh, he tolerated the Chinese culture and government, even adapted to it. He gives up the nomadic lifestyle and lives in a, in a Chinese court and palace. Uh, he tries to invade Japan twice, and both times he fails, so Japan is never conquered by the Mongols. Uh, he's over after he dies, the the um, Wan Dynasty is overthrown, uh, and China eventually Chinese people eventually come back to control China and as the Ming Dynasty. Moving on to Korea. Uh, Korea is heavily influenced by China during this early development period. Um, the Chinese attempt and at times they successfully conquer Korea, so the Chinese are heavily influenced in this region through language, writing, culture artwork, all that stuff. Eventually, there are three main kingdoms that develop in Korea. They're the Koguryo, Pakchi, and the Silla uh, kingdoms. The Silla is kind of the one that comes out on top of these three, and are the first group of Koreans to conquer the entire Korean peninsula. Uh, since they're heavily influenced by the Chinese, they, they adopted Buddhism as a state religion, but they also support Confucian ideas, this idea of Neo-Confucianism, right? Mixing these two religions together. They also adapted and developed their own standard of writing from the Chinese. After the Silla decline, a new dynasty comes to power in the year 918, and that's the Koryo dynasty. Uh, that's the root of where the modern name of Korea comes from, is from this dynasty. Uh, they have advancements. Again, they're heavily influenced by China. Um, they adapt a lot of information and, and technology from China, uh, including different movable type, right? The blocks to move different characters or the writing around to produce new words. Uh, but they're the first to use metal type in a printing system, which is uh, much more efficient uh, than wood type blocks, and they last longer. And finally, Japan. Uh, Japan develops as a civilization kind of later on, right? They develop in the 400s AD, um, and their native religion is known as Shinto. Uh, it's a very animistic religion, meaning that they believe parts of nature have spirits, uh, and these spirits are called kami. And these kami are animate and live in certain features, like they could be in waterfalls, winds, the mountains, rivers, all these things, and they believe in these spirits and how the spirits influence the world. The Yamato clan is the clan of the nomadic people in Japan that eventually come to control all over Japan, around the 400. Uh, it's actually the longest continuous imperial family in the world, because this Yamato clan, the descendants of these people, are still the emperors of Japan today. Uh, and they 
for a while, right, they believed the Yamato emperors were part of, related to these divine kami, these divine spirits. They put a, a religious significance to the empire. Uh, they adopt Buddhism, and that's kind of merged with Shinto. So they had this mixture of the two religions in Japan up to this day. They also adopt the Chinese system of writing. So they are heavily influenced, like Korea, they're heavily influenced by the Chinese. And just like in medieval Europe, you have in Japan development of feudalism, right? Which is rulers give land um, out to different people in return for taxes, right? And it's a decentralized system. There's not one strong ruler, but lots of small independent kingdoms, uh, even though they all technically adhere to the rule of the emperor. emperor. So you have samurai, which would be the same things as knights um, in in Europe, although samurai are not mounted, they don't have horses. The Bushido is the code the samurai live by, just like chivalry is the code the knights lived by. The emperor would be the king, and the daimo are the nobles, the nobility in the in Japan. Eventually, what happens is different clans fight, and you have the development of shogunates or shoguns. And a shogun is essentially a military dictator. So through this feudal system, shoguns come to power. Uh, and they're the ones that hold real power. Even though the emperor is still a thing, the emperor still exists, these nobles still exist, it's really the shogun who's running the show. And this happens all the way up until the modern era when Japan opens up its borders to the outside world.